In part one, we talked about the weirdness and struggle of opening for New Zealand. I mean, we finished that chapter talking about Danny Morrison opening the batting. The Kiwis were playing club cricket in a test, and it meant that the man who would become a world-famous bunny was the last New Zealander to open the batting and bowling in a test match. But that's not the record we want to focus on. Danny Morrison once held a world record in test cricket for his batting. The most ducks. A duck every second match. And he opened the banning, because of course he did. This is New Zealand. But it's wrong to say that New Zealand never produced incredible openers, because kind of out of nowhere, they produced a world-class version. Glenn Turner made his debut in 1969, the first year that New Zealand ever won a test series. When Turner played, there was actually quite a few incredible top order players around, and he was right up there with them. But somehow in a 14 year test career, Turner only played 41 matches. Before Turner, New Zealand had played 83 tests and they had won four of them. With him, they won six from 41. Now, obviously he wasn't the only player around. Richard Hadley turned up. But Turner was shoring up a top order for a team that had never really had one before. And we don't know what Glenn Turner really could have done for New Zealand because just at the point that New Zealand cricket finally got good, he stopped playing for them. We don't have enough time to go through all of Glenn Turner's issues with New Zealand cricket, but I think it breaks down quite simply. At the age of 21, Turner would travel back and forth on the boat to England. This isn't what New Zealand cricketers had previously done. They either stayed in New Zealand and remained largely amateurs, or they moved to England and became professionals. The idea of doing both just didn't really make that much sense. And New Zealand cricket was incredibly amateur at that point, almost by design. And he was Turner who was a professional around the world, who worked on his game like it was a job. And those professional skills, which often had him called selfish in New Zealand, meant that at the age of 22, he carried his bat through an innings, making 43 from 226 balls. And a couple of years later, he carried his bat again. Bill Woodfill, Bill Laurie and Len Hutton were the only batters in history to have done it twice at that point. If Turner was abrupt, and demanding, it's because he knew what it took to be one of the best players in the world. And his team simply did not. And in 1977, just as New Zealand were about to get really good, there was a clash between Turner and the cricket board. Turner resigned from the New Zealand captaincy that year. He was 30 and clearly in his prime as a batter. Later that year, he played for Worcestershire against Glamorgan. He made 141. The next highest score for his team was seven. He made 141 and the team made 169. 83% of the team's runs. According to statistician Charles Davis, Turner had the 12th best balls between dismissals mark ever. Essentially, New Zealand had their greatest ever top order player and they weren't ready for him. And this wasn't even the only time that New Zealand had lost an incredible opener to England and county cricket. When New Zealand started test cricket, Stuart Dempster had been playing first class cricket for nearly a decade. He took New Zealand's first ball in tests and in three years, he averaged 65 over 10 matches. Nine of those were as an opener. New Zealand could not have been any luckier to find a player as experienced and ready for tests as he was. But he didn't last long. He was recruited by Julian Kahn, an eccentric millionaire who hired really good cricketers for his own personal cricket team that Julian Kahn also played in. Dempster would move to England, and when not playing for Kahn, he would go on to have a stunning career for Leicestershire but not for New Zealand, as he only ever played those 10 matches. Dempster's average of 58 is slightly flattered by the kind of attacks England put out for New Zealand. But to this day, New Zealand only have three men who have opened up 10 times with an average of 45 plus. Both of them stopped playing for the national team at the age of 30. Now we're gonna go back slightly to the weird nature of New Zealand openers. Bert Vance was not as good as Glenn Turner or Stewie Dempster. He grew up in a cricket family. His father played the first class game and was also chairman of New Zealand cricket. In Vance's first six domestic seasons, he never averaged over 30 or made 100. In his first year, he averaged 7.75 with a top score of 29. Only in New Zealand does this story end with him opening the batting for his country. At that stage, he was a wicketkeeper, and he would reinvent himself as an opening batter. And from that point onwards, he would score 5,000 runs in first-class cricket an average of 39, which is why at the age of 33, he was given four tests to open. His strike rate in those tests was 32, because of course it was, and he made 150. But none of that is why I'm bringing him up, 
because this is more or less what you would expect of a New Zealand opener now that I've laid the groundwork for you. A wicketkeeper turned opener spends a decade to get a handful of tests where he blocks the absolute f shit out of the ball. That is the story of pretty much every second Kiwi opener ever. But Vance has something else to offer us. Yes, Bert Vance once allowed 77 runs from a single over. His team, Wellington, had to win their last match of the year to win the Shell Trophy. Wellington set Canterbury 291 in 59 overs. The Wellington bowlers did well, getting them 108 for 8, but Lee Jamon, who somehow never opened for New Zealand, held them at bay. With two overs left to play, Canterbury were on 196 for 8, and they were a very good chance of getting the draw. It's clear that at this point Wellington thought they couldn't get the wickets normally. So they thought by allowing Canterbury to smash a lot of runs, they might knock something loose and allow for something magical to happen in the last over. Vance, who didn't really bowl because he was once a wicketkeeper, was asked to come on and deliver no balls that were either full tosses or long hops. And he started the over bowling already at the crease. But let me play this over out for you. Yeah, that's quite something. But it all gets slightly better. The next over, Jamon kept slogging, and he took 17 runs from five more balls, meaning that Roger Ford was batting for the last ball and all he needed was one run. But for some reason, he blocked it instead. And that reason is that the scoreboard operators had got lost, and Canterbury didn't even know they were that close to winning the game. So the game ended in a draw, but the scores were actually tied. And because all the other results went their way anyway, Wellington still won the Shell Trophy. But just, just one moment here. I need to go back and look at that over again because something doesn't quite seem right. Ah, yes, this is what I thought. Only five legal balls. I mean, you can't really blame the umpires or the scoreboard attendants here. This was one of the craziest overs ever. And of course it was bowled by a New Zealand over. Who else would have bowled it? An over that was absolutely stupid and ultimately had no effect on the world. I don't know what Bert Rance's story really tells us about anything, but it existed. But let's focus on some incredible batting instead. How about this? How about a player making his debut and putting on an opening partnership of 159, where he scored 107 of them from 110 balls. And then in the second innings, he knocked up another 56 runs. Rodney Redmond had an incredible start to test cricket. The only problem was, it was also the end. Terry Jarvis had been the New Zealand opener at that point, but in 13 tests over eight years, he had averaged 29, making only 100. A player called John Parker was supposed to be the opener, but he had broken his thumb early in the series. So Jarvis had opened before then being replaced by Redmond, but it was Parker that they wanted to open the batting. Parker would eventually play 36 tests. In nine of those he would open, and he'd average 19 with 100. And if that doesn't make any sense, of course it doesn't. Parker made 100 in nine tests. Redmond made 100 in one test. But the problem for Redmond was, at that time, the next tour was four months away, and there was talk that his eyesight was not ideal. But essentially, I think the selectors just wanted Parker and they went with it. And the following home summer, Redmond didn't even play first class cricket. But there is actually even another twist to Redmond's story. Not only was he a test opener, he sired one. Aaron Redmond would play eight tests and open in seven of them, and never made a hundred. And if it seems a bit weird to you that you would have two opening batters who are father and son, if you know anything about New Zealand cricket, you'll know that this just isn't weird. This is a normal thing, but it really shows up in the openers. It's like opening the batting in New Zealand is some doomed ancient bloodline passed down to those who are truly worthy or unlucky enough. And obviously New Zealand players being related to each other is not exactly a thing just about the openers. But if you do look through the openers, you certainly see a lot of links here. And it's not just in men's cricket. Bruce Murray opened the batting for New Zealand. His granddaughter, Amelia Kerr, plays for them today. Walter Hadley did incredible things for New Zealand cricket. But did he ever do anything better than simply ejaculate Richard Hadley? And Jeff Crow wasn't just related to the great Martin, but also Maximus. I'm not sure what that means, but... And the Redmonds are obviously not alone. Amongst openers, we've had three other father-son combos. Mac Anderson begat Robert, Rod Latham begat Tom, and Ken Rutherford begat Hamish. 
I don't really know what happens in the Bible, so I don't know if that means that one brother has to rise up and slay another one. And sadly, none of the New Zealand brothers ever actually battered together. So no chance of someone being sawn off in a brotherly run out. But the Marshall twins both opened. So did Matt and Phil Horn, 10 years apart. And when John Parker failed to live up to what Rodney Redmond had done, they didn't ask Redmond to come back and have a go. They let his brother, Murray Parker, do it. This isn't some royal lineage. It's more like inheriting the family blacksmith business and not having the skills to do anything else. But there is just something romantic about having a better than one in seven chance of being a Kiwi opener and being related to another one. A brother, a father, a son. New Zealand openers might look like a ragtag bunch of disparate battlers, but this is a family. Of course, that doesn't always mean that it's family friendly. In 2008, in an Indian hotel room, Lou Vincent was offered a prostitute and a bunch of American dollars. Soon after, he was fixing cricket matches. Five years earlier, in 2003, it was completely different. He was opening the batting at the Wacker on debut, and he made 100 against Glenn McGrath, Jason Gillespie, Brett Lee, and Shane Waugh. Well, he gets away beautifully. It was short, and he's cracked it through cover point. He made 50 in the second innings as well. Later, he would make 100 in Mahali against Sahi Khan, Habajan Singh, and Anil Kumble. Two years later, he was out of the side altogether. He came back in 2005 and he made a double century against Chumin Devas, Lasif Malinga, and Murali. Two tests later, he made a 92 against Zimbabwe. And then he wouldn't play another match until 07, and then he just never played again after that. My name is Lou Vincent and I am a cheat. This is what he said about his career afterwards to TV3. I probably had a chip on my shoulder over my career. I left New Zealand pretty heartbroken and a bit angry at the system. And as the match fixing world opened up to me, I thought, yeah, I'm gonna make some big money now, so stuff the world. This isn't an excuse. There have been plenty of players, let alone plenty of New Zealand openers whose treatment just hasn't really made that much sense. And it is clear that Vincent's treatment was unfair at times, but he really wasn't that much different to a lot of the other guys on this list. He averaged 35 in first class cricket and was having to battle for every run at test level. And when the selectors turfed him, he was vulnerable. And the mistake he made is what he will be remembered for. But Lou Vincent made 300s and against real bowlers. I don't really know what to say here. Vincent could clearly play. He was probably just not good enough to have a really long career. And then he made a mistake. And it's a mistake that will follow him forever. But when I think about him, I think about him more as he was a New Zealand opener, and he went out and he faced the greatest bowlers of his era, and sometimes he made incredible runs. There's clearly no honour in everything he did in his life, but there was when he went out there and faced these men. I potter around with a the guitar these days. It's considerably wider than my old grey nickels. I haven't seen Jared's episodes on New Zealand openers, but apparently there's one more to come. Look out and enjoy. <laughs>